In this lecture, we'll finally introduce matrices and go over some basic terminology and concepts. A matrix is just a two-dimensional grid of numbers. These numbers are arranged in rows from left to right and in columns from top to bottom. Let's look at matrices in their abstract form, like this. Typically, we use capital letters as variables that represent entire matrices, and we use the lowercase form of the same letter to denote individual elements of that matrix. Each element is denoted by a row index and a column index. For example, A11 is the element at the first row and first column. A12 is the element at the first row and second column. The first index is the row index, and the second index is the column index. We write the row index and column index right next to each other. This might seem confusing, but make sure not to read the first element as A11. It's A11. If we have 10 or more rows or columns, we'd separate the row index and column index with a comma, but if both are less than 10, then we always write the indices next to each other without the comma. In this example, the matrix A has m rows and n columns. This means the last element in the matrix is A, M, N. In this example, and in this course in general, we assume all elements are real numbers, so we say that capital A is a member of R, M by N. Instead of thinking of the individual elements of a matrix one by one, it's usually more useful to think of a matrix as a collection of vectors. For example, you can look at a matrix as a collection of column vectors. There are N column vectors, each with M elements. You can also think of a matrix as a collection of row vectors. We've got m row vectors, each with n elements. Sometimes it's more useful to think of matrices as a list of column vectors, and sometimes it's more useful to think of matrices as a list of row vectors. It depends on the situation. Now that we've defined what a matrix is, let's look at how matrices interact with vectors. We can multiply matrices with vectors, but there are some constraints we have to follow. Imagine we have a matrix A with m rows and n columns and we have a vector x with n elements. Then we can define the matrix vector product AX. This product is only defined when the number of columns of A is the same as the number of elements of x. If A has n columns, then x must have n elements. If we've met that constraint, here is how we actually compute the product. Let's look at A as a series of row vectors. There are m row vectors, each with n elements. The vector x also has n elements. The product ax is just another vector, this time with m elements. Each element of this new vector is the dot product of the corresponding row of a with x. For example, the first element is the dot product of a1 with x, the second element is the dot product of a2 with x, and the last element is the dot product of am with x. Since these are all dot products, this explains the constraint. The dot product is only defined when the two vectors have the same number of elements. So what happens when we multiply two matrices together? Imagine we have a matrix A with m rows and n columns, and a matrix B with n rows and k columns. The number of columns of A must be the same as the number of rows of B. Then we can define the matrix matrix product AB. We compute the product AB in a very similar way. The product AB is another matrix where each element is the dot product of the corresponding row vector of A with the corresponding column vector of B. For example, the element in row 1 and column 1 of the new matrix is the dot product of A1 with B1. The element in row M and column K of the new matrix is the dot product of AM with BK. This means the new matrix has M rows and K columns. Again. Because of the dot product, we see why the number of columns of A must match the number of rows of B. Notice that the matrix vector multiplication from earlier is just a special case of matrix matrix multiplication, where the matrix B has n rows but only one column. We haven't gone over this, but instead of multiplying a matrix followed by a vector, we can multiply a vector followed by a matrix. In this case, the vector is a row vector with n elements. This is also a special case of matrix matrix multiplication where A has one row and n columns. Now that we've covered matrix multiplication, let's look at why matrices are so useful. We can multiply a matrix A with a column vector x to produce a new column vector y. When everything's written out, it looks like this. Imagine we know all the elements of y and a 
but all the elements of x are unknown. Then the equation y equals ax represents a linear system of equations where the elements of x are the unknowns. For example, we can look at the first row to get the first equation. y1 equals a11 times x1 plus a12 times x2 and so on all the way until a1n times xn. The second equation is y2 equals a21 times x1 plus a22 times x2 and so on. You get the idea. We can use algebra to combine the equations together and cancel one equation with the others until we have solved for the values of the different elements of x. But that's very tedious. And it doesn't tell us much about the structure of the problem. This representation here is much more compact. It's almost always more useful to use the matrix representation of this linear system of equations. And in general, it's much easier to work with once you've gotten used to it. Although you can think of y equals ax as a linear system of equations, it's very helpful to think of it in a different way. ax can be written as x1 times a1 plus x2 times a2 and so on until xn times an. Remember that x1, x2, xn are all scalars and a1, a2, an are all column vectors. So this means we multiply the different column vectors of a by scalars which means we stretch or shrink them, and then we add them all together to get one vector. a times x is just a very compact way to represent vector addition. We start at the origin, then we go along a1 by x1 steps, then we go along a2 by x2 steps, and so on and so on. Where these steps aren't necessarily integers, but possibly fractional steps. We can also imagine we're mixing the column vectors together. We take some of a1, some of a2, and mix them all together to get the vector y. Thinking this way will really improve your intuition and help you visualize what happens when you multiply a matrix by a vector. We can also classify matrices by their shape. Imagine we have a matrix with m rows and n columns. If m is greater than n, then the matrix is taller than it is wide. So we say it's skinny. I didn't make these terms up. These are actual terms. If m is less than n, then the matrix is wider than it is tall, so we say it's fat. If the matrix has the same number of rows and columns, we say it's square. Square matrices in particular are extremely important, and they show up everywhere. Square matrices have special properties. For example, there's a special type of square matrix where all the elements are zero, except for the elements along the main diagonal, which are all exactly one. The main diagonal is the line of elements where the row index is equal to the column index. The identity matrix is called the identity matrix because if you multiply it with any square matrix, you get that same matrix back again. It's like multiplying by the number 1, but with matrices. If you have a square matrix A, then A times I equals A, and I times A also equals A. As a side note, often people will omit the zeros when writing the elements of a matrix. Wherever you see a blank space in a matrix, that space is understood to contain a zero. Finally, note that identity matrices can come in different sizes. You can have an identity matrix with just two rows and two columns, or an identity matrix with a thousand rows and a thousand columns. Now we get to our last concept for this lecture. Some square matrices, some but not all square matrices, have a special matrix associated with them called the inverse matrix. If we have a matrix A with n rows and n columns, we denote the inverse of A as A to the minus 1. The inverse matrix is another square matrix with this property. If you multiply a square matrix with its inverse in either order, the product is the identity matrix. The inverse matrix A minus 1 inverts the matrix A. Again, not all square matrices have an inverse, but if the inverse exists, it's unique given the particular choice of the matrix A. I'm not going to go over how to actually compute the inverse matrix. You can easily look up the formula. And in practice, people often just use software. The important thing here is the concept of the inverse. Now let's tie everything together. Let's go back to our equation y equals ax. If a is invertible, meaning if a has an inverse, then we can solve for the vector x by multiplying both sides of the equation by the inverse matrix. The solution for the vector x is just a minus 1 times y. Instead of going through all the tedious algebra of solving a linear system of equations, you can just compute the inverse matrix using Python or some other software tool, multiply that inverse with the vector y 
And in two seconds, you've solved for all the unknown variables. But here's one key thing you should keep in the back of your mind. This only works if A is invertible. But there are lots of real world situations that can't be represented by an invertible matrix. So what do we do then? That's where the least squares algorithm comes in. And in just a couple lectures, we'll go over it and see why it's so useful. That sums up the very basics of matrices. Next time, we'll go over some important properties of matrices, like the null space, range, and rank of a matrix, and the concept of orthogonality. These properties will show up over and over again when we cover more advanced topics, and they'll prove indispensable.